Okay, we're back again here at allpointstv.com. And we're glad that all of you are here, that are here now at this point. And I know a lot of you will tune in later after we uh, do the taping of the program. A lot of you should join us before we uh, tape the show. And it's available on a number of uh, different networks for the next, uh, well, as long, until they take it down. <clears throat> They're not taking it down too much anymore. Uh, the studio has uh, been rocking with the, <laughs> with the sensors. <laughs> They're not censoring us too much anymore. I, I, when I when I do Facebook, and I, and I and I post on Facebook every day that I'm uh, that I'm in the country, unless I'm traveling outside the city to some other state, and um, I'll be doing that sometime in August for a week. But um, as long as I'm uh, I'm in the uh, country, I uh, I post every day on Facebook. And Facebook, you've been really good uh, the last uh, almost, it's almost been a year because I would uh, be typing on, on the screen and uh, I could tell that I, the watchmen were in the background because I would type at a certain speed and the letters are going up very piecemeal and very slow. And before I knew it, woof, all of the things I typed on the screen had disappeared. <laughs> And they found out what I was doing, uh, what I began to do to kind of countervail against them doing that against me, uh, wait until I get to the end of a, my article and then wipe it off the screen. Very discouraging. But I'm very hard to discourage. So what I what I'm going to do was um, type a paragraph and then save it, type two paragraphs and save that. And by the time that I got to the end of it, I had everything saved. And when they were wiped off the screen, I had to put it back up there again. And over time, they, they learned, I, I guess they learned to, to leave my uh, post alone because they have not been doing anything against me for the last uh, year or so. And now I'm getting very comfortable with uh, just typing and assuming that I, everything I'm typing will be allowed to go through because they're definitely reading and surveying what we're doing on Facebook and other networks. You'd be surprised that we're living in a surveillance state. Uh, in this country right now, <clears throat> and we may well be, well, I don't know if this be true or not, but we, but we may well be one of the most surveilled um, countries in the world. Cameras everywhere on the streets, <clears throat> and you can't hardly do anything without some camera capturing uh, what's, what, 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 what happened from um, wherever you are, because you got cameras on these on these uh, poles, and uh, where they have these wires connecting, they would have uh, cameras uh, filming everything on the streets. And so you're not as um, unsurveyed here as you are anywhere else. I think I think that um, you know, in a place where they have a lot of technology. You're, you're gonna you're living in a surveillance state more so than you are in, in where I was for a month. Last month I was in in um, West Africa, and you're not. Can I say this? You're not. Yeah, you're not under so much surveillance uh, there. With the, of course they they what they have there a lot of <clears throat> people that are kind of working under undercover. And you might be talking to someone, don't know what you're talking to, a person of the government. And uh, that might be a way of surveying it uh, pretty much over there. And I've seen a lot of a lot of it in terms of people very paranoid in terms of uh, opening up a certain discussion. And they are reluctant to uh, engage it because they don't know, they don't know who, who you are and who they're talking to. <clears throat> but here we have a lot of surveillance that goes on because we have a technology that can pick up from centralized locations. I, I remember, I'm, I'm going to get off this, but I, I remember when I was uh, down there in Cleveland at the Republican Party's convention, I think this was in, in 20, was this 20, I think it's the 2020 election. And I went down there to, uh, uh, Ohio, and the guy, one guy came and sat by me. He said, you know, uh, this whole 
area is is uh is is, is can be seen by the cameras they had and they were the, the feeds were uh going to an underground uh unit and they could watch everything that's going in that in that square and they had officers that were, that were walking around as security that were from uh, different parts of the country and they, it might have been the south carolina delegation they'd all be around they'd all be walking around together as one unit and there were a lot of battalions that were there. It, it was so secure that the only thing I had to worry about at that time in Ohio was the, I was wearing this this uh, U of M hat. And if you know about the rivalry between <laughs> Ohio State <laughs> and uh, the University of Michigan, you know how serious that is in, in Ohio. Those guys take that very seriously down there. And uh, one, one, in, fact, in fact, one of the um, militia uh, members uh, came with me laughing, said, uh, asked me if I was having a problem with that hat because I was wearing this hat. And uh, told me that the only, only incident I had was one guy came up to me. He told me very menacingly, the guy walked up. He said to me, uh, I owe you one. And he owed, me, he owed me one for me having the audacity to wear this hat of all places to wear this hat in Ohio. And uh, that's that's really that's really serious uh, there. I think it's more serious there. I don't know. It might be serious here too, but I don't go to uh, games in in Arbor, so I'm not sure exactly how it plays uh, where we have our, have the football team in in this state at the University of Michigan. And when I went first went down there, and they were saying the and they were capitalizing T H E. I was uh, down there and at, on the campus saying that you that you you got the capital T H E and you can't capitalize the, the the word the, and they were saying no. What we're saying here by that is that we're saying the University of Michigan to distinguish it from uh, my alma mater, Eastern, and then from Michigan State that's uh, in 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 Lansing. So they were making a uh, disregulation of, of the fact that this is the university that was saying by the name T-H-E, capital T-H-E. <clears throat> but it's, it, I'm not sure, it may be as serious in Ann Arbor as, as it is in uh, in Ohio, but I don't get that because uh, in Flint, you know, we have the uh, Flint campus, you don't have the same amount of, um, you know, you know how, how you, the same kind of of, of patriotic emotions about the team. I mean, they have a homecoming locally, but it doesn't nearly rival what they do in Ann Arbor. But I can tell you that down in Ohio is a very serious matter. Okay, I'm, um, I want to. What I want to do today in this uh, conversation is pick up where we went up, where we left off last week. Uh, you recall I was uh, I, uh, before I got up on 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 a tangent. And I get off on a lot of tangents um, in, in the way I'm not a linear thinker. So I get off on a lot of tangents. And um, but before I before I got off on, on the tangent last week, I was talking about um, the holiday, the new holiday, I think it became the holiday in 2022, somewhere around there. Yeah, because it's the third anniversary that they celebrate this one place I was this past uh, week. And uh, they had three different um, Juneteenth celebrations. Well, it was well organized. I want to commend the people that organized it. Um, and I was asked to say a few words about it. I don't think that people were, were, were ready for what I had to say uh, because I don't think we really know a lot about this holiday although we claim that it was um the last time that those that were enslaved in those plantations in the southern states or in the in the country because there were four uh, slave states that were in the northern part of the or in the union part of the uh, country there were 15 slave states all, all together to recognize slavery as of, of the time period when this war broke out on April the 12th, 1860, 1861 rather. 
because the firing of Fort Sumter's way ignited this war. The firing of Fort Sumter was because by the southern states, 11 of them had by the time of the firing of Fort well, at the firing of Fort Sumter, seven states had declared their independence. They had seceded from the, from the Union. And that meant that South Carolina, that was at the uh, head of it, it meant that the forts that were, the federal forts that were in South Carolina were now on foreign soil. The, those, um, those Union forts, Fort Sumter being one of them, that fort was now in another country because those those states south carolina and six other states had set up a confederacy and they had uh, declared an independence from the united states and had set up the confederate states of america and when fort sumter was in fact uh, fired upon i think that might have lasted 13 uh, hours or so uh, I went. I went to that fort and was shooting. Um, the, uh, what was happening was they were shooting um, cannonballs into Fort Sumter, and those cannonballs were cannonballs were heated red. It was, I mean, it was it was shooting fire into um, into the fort, and so of course all of the um, non-ranking officers were the ones put there in the front. And then the um, more senior officers were in the background, so they would make sure they, got, they were getting out of the way. But when, when they fired on Fort Sumter, then that war then was was on because now the shooting had started. The secession, though, had started before even Lincoln was inaugurated because the inauguration of Lincoln, although he'd been elected in uh, November, the inauguration of the president would have taken place March the 4th of the following year. So the president, Lincoln, the 16th president, was inaugurated on the um, 4th of, of March, 1861. The firing of Fort Sumter took place on the 12th of, of April the following month. But the secession had already occurred before Lincoln took office. Uh, seven states by the time he took office had already left the Union. When he reinforced the fort with uh, Major General Beauregard, um, who had moved from another fort that was not quite as, not able to defend that fort as well, he had moved into Fort Sumter. And Lincoln decided to uh, rather than vacate Fort Sumner, decided, decided to re-ration uh, the, the fort. In other words, to reinforce the fort with food and other armaments. And when he did that, rather than vacating that fort, then that war is, um, um, that, that, that the shooting had started because they were, they were demanding that fort be turned over to the state. And when it was not turned over, then the shooting of the, the shooting war started. Now, this war is a, a war of um, Southern secession. It is not a war over slavery. It will not be a war over slavery for two years because the war was to bring the Southern states that were out of the Union to bring them back into the Union. And that had to be clarified because there were a number of problems that Lincoln had. Uh, if he had declared this war as being a war over slavery, they, that meant that the North, the Northern soldiers were fighting to, to free slaves who would then become competitors in the labor force. <clears throat> because those, because you, if you free those slaves, they become competitors for the jobs that were that were at this point uh, not in competition because the slaves were on plantations. But if you if that if, if the war is going to free those slaves, then those slaves are now going to enter into the workforce, and by work, entering the work, workforce, they're going to have the same effect 
that this immigration has in this country right now with these immigrants being met in this country. Because the immigrants are what they're going to do first and foremost and already are in fact doing is lowering the wages because you have more uh, workers than you have work for them to do. And therefore, the bidding of their uh, labor goes down. Of course, a lot of these persons that come into the country are being paid under the table anyway. And that's the whole thing behind why this um, invasion is allowed to go on because it benefits the uh, manufacturers and it benefits the uh, politicians and the two of them, because the manufacturers are the ones that are financing the um, the, 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 the campaigns of these politicians. And therefore, the politicians are scratching their back by letting the, the laborers come in at a, at a lower wage and working underneath the pay scale. One of the, you see, the politicians are, uh, these are very devious pe people. They always have been. And you can claim, on the one hand, you got a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Of course, that makes all the workers feel like uh, that is um, the politicians are benefiting them. And then you have the wage at $15 an hour, which nobody's paying because what you're doing is undercutting it by hiring in workers. They're working underneath that, that scale. And by working underneath that scale, the $15 wage is not being reached because there's so much undercutting that's going on otherwise. And bringing that labor force in here from outside the country is one way of doing that. So you get the benefit of the people who think that the politicians have passed the minimum wage that's raised the quality of life. At the same time, they're undercutting it and getting the benefit of those who are the donors that would that would finance their campaign. So they're playing both ends against the middle again and benefiting from, from both ends of, of the candle being being burned on, on both ends. You know, these as I said, they're very devious. And uh, anything they do, look look for the benefit to themselves. And if there's any unintended consequence, then it's the benefit to, to others as well. But that's not the in, initial intent. So the war is a war of Southern secession. It ought to be defined that way because the war is to bring the Southern states back into the Union. But when the Fort, I'm talking about Fort Sumter, was defended by Abraham Lincoln, then four additional states went out and joined the Confederacy. And why they joined it? They joined it because they knew that they had a right under the uh, terms of the Constitution's founding in 1787, they knew that the uh, states had retained the right to their sovereignty, although they voluntarily relinquished it and created, and created the United States. They had uh, come together to create the United States, but the United States is just the, the, the individual states uniting with each other voluntarily and coming into a United States as individual states, though, having retained their sovereignty as individual states, but relinquishing some of it so as to create a centralized uh, government. But you have to understand something here, that if it, uh, if the terms of, that of which they came together to form the United States were in fact changed, altered in any, any way in which it, was, it became palatable to no longer maintain the terms because the contract that would have been uh, based upon their coming together uh, under those terms. If you change those terms, then it is uh, understood that the terms have changed. Okay. Well, we don't need, well, they don't need anything, or they represent. They don't, you know, they, they say, when did it be transition? We were supposed to be represented by the government. Yeah. Now we're referring to the people who don't, or questioning the government, use the term leaders. And it's like, see, we're supposed to be represented. That, that came to me the other day when I was writing on it. Why are we allowing people to call our leaders mm -hmm. when they're supposed to represent us? So I think that's what question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, the Constitution, uh, now we're talking, we can talk about the Constitution today because, you know, it's been amended. It was amended three times during the, um, during the, uh, the war years, the Civil War years and the, and the immediate aftermath. The 13th Amendment passed and that was ratified in 1860, 
60, uh, 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 five, and then the 14th Amendment, 1868, and the 15th Amendment, 1870. Now, the terms of, of have, have, have now been altered uh, during this war. And, and that would be like the 14th Amendment says that uh, if there is a state that would deny someone the rights under the Constitution, as the terms were now changed under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, then that state should lose some of his representation so as to have a penalty if they in fact did not carry out these two these new terms that had been changed by the, by the character of this war. Now don't forget this war is not about uh, slavery uh, ending in the uh, in, in in the country. Uh, that was never that was never uh, link this is this was not Lincoln's intent. Now, I know this is going to set a lot of people uh, aflame here, but you have to keep in mind the character's war is, 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 is being altered as the war is being fought. And part of that is, is because of the discussion that had been going on for two years since the war was began on April the 12th, 1861, with the firing of Fort Sumter. But the Emancipation Proclamation is not issued until January the 1st, 1863. And even in that, there was a chance for the South to lay down its arms and come back into the Union. If they had done that, then the Emancipation Proclamation would not have been issued. I'm going to read something to you here that will um, make that point. But I want to set this, set this up so you can understand it. Because if the South had laid down its arms prior to January the 1st, then that Emancipation Proclamation would not have been issued. And when I read this to you, you'll be able to see that in terms of what uh, Abraham Lincoln is saying in the preliminary uh, document. But to the question, to the answer of the of the question about the, uh, the the representation issue, is that you have to understand something here. The Constitution of the United States, and this is my contention. I'm probably the only one in the country contending this, but there's no scholar that is qualified to say anything different. They they may think they they are qualified. They're not qualified. Um, <clears throat> nobody in this country understands the Constitution better than I do. And, uh, and, and that's just a fact. I'm not bragging about that, but that's just a, that is just a fact. Um, the, if you, you see, the Constitution is the first seven articles of the document. It is those, it is those terms in the first seven articles of the Constitution that is the ter are the terms to which the seven, uh, to which the 13 colonists come together and decide that they're going to abrogate what they had in place prior to that, prior to the meeting in the Constitutional Convention in 1787, that they are going to now set new terms of this confederation. And those terms are the seven articles that they wrote into the Constitution. There are no amendments at this point. When they ratified the document in 1788, it was seven articles that they ratified. Now those terms, and here's my contention, those terms that were ratified in 1788 are the terms for the Confederation. If any terms are in fact changed in terms of agreement that made, they made them come together and uh, confederate, if those terms are changed, they have the right then at that point, if you abrogate the terms of the Confederation that which they came in and confederate, then to change those terms is therefore to change the contract that they had in place that brought about the Confederation in the first place. One of which is Article 1, Section 4, Clause 4. And that part of the Constitution says the, that every state is guaranteed a Republican form of government. Now that's, that is a major part of this agreement, a major part of the agreement there, that, they are, that they now have set up the United States. The United States being this state, that state, and 13 states and all, all coming together to form the United States. You see, it's a, it's a plural plurality involved here. It is both the states individually, 
And it's also the United States with the coming together as a collective. And it's on both levels that this document now has to speak. It only speaks at the one level prior to the 14th Amendment. But the 14th Amendment extrapolates the, the terms from the individual states and now it makes the collective, puts it all on the collective umbrella. That's a change in the terms of the, of, of the, of the Confederation, of the United States. Because to say that every state is, is, is guaranteed a Republican form of government means then that you cannot pass in the 14th Amendment, Section 3. Because Section 3 allows for uh, when, the, when the states have been brought back into the Union at the end of this, uh, at the end of this war, this war ends on the 9th of, of, of April, 1865, when, uh, when, when uh, Joan, Joan Lee um, met with um, Ulysses S. Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse and signed the terms where he, and where Lee had Lee had too much he was too much of a statesman to do what many of the soldiers wanted to do, which was in which Billy the Kid, Billy the Kid, not Billy the Kid, Jesse James uh did. The guerrilla warfare. Doesn't matter talk about Jesse James being uh, why, why were they robbing those banks and everything? They, that was part of the, of, the of, of that's a part of the group that did not want to hand their guns over. Did not want to end this uh, this war. They, but but uh, Lee was too much of a of a of a gentleman, too much of a statesman to go back on his word. He had he had surrendered his military at the Appomattox uh, uh, courthouse, and he stuck to that that agreement being made on the uh, ninth of uh, April 1865, when that war came to a close. But when you have them saying in the aftermath of that war, uh, which they passed the 13th Amendment on December the 6th of that year of 1865. So you can see here that if you have the 13th Amendment that ended child slavery in the United States, only child slavery, it was ended by the 13th Amendment. Slavery has never been outlawed in this country, by the way. You have to go back and read the amendment and you see that slavery has not been outlawed. What you have here is that the chattel slavery uh, as the 13th Amendment was, was outlawed, but not outlawed by the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation did not, did not outlaw slavery in the United States. What the Emancipation Proclamation did is that it declared those slaves that were in the rebellious states, if those states did not lay down their arms, then after the preliminary document had been issued, which was issued September 1862, you see we have a, we have a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation that was issued. Well, Lincoln threatened the South that if you're still fighting as of January the 1st, 1863, if the fighting is still going on 100 days after the preliminary document has been issued, then if the fighting continues in those states, then the slaves in those states, those enslaved um, uh, persons in those states that are in rebellion, they would in fact be freed under, under, under the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, as of January 1st, 1863, those states that had not been brought under the Union were still, uh, or in any part of those states, not brought under the auspices of the Union, were still at war. And therefore, uh, Lincoln issues then the Emancipation Proclamation itself at that point. Now, let me read this to you so you will not think I'm making this up. Here's what you don't have uh, in these textbooks, but need to have. This is background, and here's what it says. If you go look, look on, online, it'll, it'll read this way. The Emancipation Proclamation, officially Proclamation 95, was a presidential proclamation and executive order issued by United States President 
Abraham Lincoln, January the 1st, 1863, during the American Civil War, the proclamation had the effect, and listen very carefully to this part here, the proclamation had the effect of changing the legal status of more than 3.5 million enslaved African Americans in the secessionist Confederate states from enslaved, from enslaved to free. Now that's very specific wording there, but, it, but you notice it says here, the legal status of more than 3.5 enslaved, 3.5 million enslaved African Americans in the secession's Confederate States from enslaved to free. Now 3.5, but there are 4.5 million slaves, enslaved persons in the United States at this point. So what happened to the other 800 to some odd thousand slaves that it did not touch? Well, it didn't touch those slaves in the states that were not in rebellion against the Union. And there were four Union states that did not succeed in the Union and the Emancipation Proclamation did not touch those, did not touch those slaves. Those states are Delaware, that's um, Biden's uh, home state. Maryland, it didn't touch the slaves in Kentucky. Kentucky did not succeed from the Union. And it did not touch the slaves in Missouri. So Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, the Emancipation Proclamation did nothing to free any of those slaves in those states nor did it free any slaves in any state during the time of the issuance of the document because the Emancipation Proclamation applied to those states where Lincoln had no control. And that's why you have to see this document through new terms here. And that is to see it as what it was. It was a military document. It was not an emancipatory document. The Emancipation Proclamation is not an emancipation document. It's a military document. Because Lincoln had been told for two years by, by, by Frederick Douglass and some of the others that you're fighting this war with your right hand, but you have your left hand tied behind your back. And the left hand is that you're, that though, while those um, slave owners in the South are fighting this war, their production had not with it because they have managers on those plantations that allow, that allow the cotton to still be produced in the South, and therefore the funding of the war was not um, kindled by having anything uh, stopped, so to speak, because the slaves were still picking cotton, and therefore, rather than, than being brought off of those plantations to fight the war, they're in there aiding the war cause in the southern part of the uh, formerly the United States but no longer the United States, they are now in the, um, in the Confederate States. So Lincoln, two years later, having to come to grips with the fact that the South is not um, uh, capitulated. They thought this war would not last very long. That was the idea of both sides of this war. The war would only go on for a period of time, get the nose bloody, and both sides would decide that it wasn't worth any additional uh, bloodshed and the, and the South that had a legal right to succeed would have been, been allowed to succeed. It does not mean that um, the, the Union ceased to exist because it's not a war, it's not a civil war. That's another point that got to be made. It's not a civil war. It is a war over Southern secession. It's not a, it's not, it's not a civil war where you're fighting uh, in, inside the same space to control the same polity. These are two different polities. And the South has its fiefdom, so to speak, and is not trying to go into the Northern states and change the government that is found, found there. That's not the intent. And, and you have to go back and look at the fact that when he fought the war in, when, 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 when um, Lee carried the war into, um, uh, Pennsylvania at Gettysburg, 
where that war went on in Gettysburg from November the 1st to November the 3rd of 1863, you'll see here that uh, 16 days thereafter, when Lincoln came back to commemorate that the, the dying that occurred there, because that's the bloodiest war, that was the bloodiest uh, three days of, of the fighting during this war, Lincoln came back to uh, commemorate uh, the dying that occurred there. And that's what, what Lincoln said four score and seven years ago, our father brought forth this upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And he went on to say that we cannot dedicate, we cannot uh, uh, hollow these grounds. The dead men living here, the dead men that are, that are, that are buried here have hallowed these grounds much more than we can, in fact, uh, do. So I'm just paraphrasing what Lincoln was saying. Uh, see, on a, this, this was, the Gettysburg Address was made on the 19th of November, 16 days after the dying had occurred, but Lincoln has gone back into Pennsylvania. Now, a lot of people believe that because they were fighting in Pennsylvania, the South had decided to, to take this war into the North, and that um, and, they, and when I say in, 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 in various presentations that every war that was, that was fought to bring the South back into the Union was fought in the South, uh, people say, well, what about, um, what about uh, Gettysburg and Pennsylvania? Well, the, the answer to that question is, how do you bring the, the South back into the Union by fighting the war in the northern states that had not succeeded? The reason why they're fighting in in, 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 in in Gettysburg is because the army under uh, John uh, Lee had won the war on Chancellorville and the Union army is in retreat and, and General Lee is chasing that army. Uh, he's after that army and trying to, trying to decimate that army so he has to end this war on terms with to, to, that's beneficial to uh, uh, the South. And if he had been able to execute that and cut that army off, then that war could have ended at that point. Or it could have done this. It could have brought, uh, the other thing they were trying to do was get the, uh, the, uh, the European countries to come in on the side of the, of the, of the Confederacy. That's why they held the cotton from being sold into uh, Europe, hoping that that would, in fact, make them go with the economic interest. The economic interest was the southern part of the country was the exporting part of the country. And by holding off the cotton, it would make the uh, European states that need that textile for their own production and so on and so forth, make them come into, in fact, side with the, with the southern states. That's what, that's what Lee is doing. In uh, in in uh, in Pennsylvania, trying to rule the war into much larger context to try to exhaust the uh, North so they would cease to fight because the South is fighting a secession war here; it's not fighting a civil war. Now, in adding the Fourteenth Amendment, let me go to that point again because I think it's, that need to add to what I'm saying about the, the question. The 14th Amendment uh, has in it, because there's some resistance to the rights of the newly freed uh, slaves uh, in the country. And the Southerners are, in fact, remembering when the slaves were on these plantations, they're not willing to buy into a new ordinance for those um, enslaved persons, particularly if they were fighting against them as they were doing. Uh, when they, because Lincoln did bring those those formerly enslaved uh, uh, blacks into the Union uh, Army and had them fighting, two hundred eighty-six thousand of them fought on the side of the Union. Now you can go and watch Glory and starring Denzel Washington, which Denzel got his first, uh, he got a supporting actor act, actors award, and um, Morgan Freeman was also in that film, did a very commanding job. They had. Nice guy, Milton guy, kind of you know, uh, good cop, bad cop type of role for Denzel Washington and uh, Morgan Freeman, 
uh, Morgan Freeman was the conciliatory uh, uh, member of the, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the leadership, of the black leadership in that, in that movie of those soldiers that fought. He was the one that was um, playing the, the other role to counter the role played by Denzel. Denzel played the role of the uh, person that was um, more more of a, the militant uh, in that uh, in that in that in that movie. But what they didn't show in in the movie called Glory. Go back and look at Glory, and you can pick up some things that, from that. But in the movie called Glory, what they didn't show is that there were blacks who were fighting in the on in the Confederate army, and were fighting in the Confederate army for the same reason that the um, the Southerners, uh, the, 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 the slave owners were, were, were fighting. They were fighting because the, the, uh, the, the Union Army had invaded the South. And the South is where their homes were too. Now, it's, it's hard for people to, to stomach that. They'd say, well, they were down there fighting for uh, slavery. They were, fighting. they were not fighting for slavery. They were fighting in, because their homeland was in the South. And you can go and read on the other side of it, there's some very good documentation out. You're not going to read it in the, in the university classrooms. They try to act like this is one sided where all the blacks on one side, uh, all the slave owners on, on, on one side, and so on and so forth. And they know. Um, and all the, all the blacks, when they're fighting the war, they're fighting on the Union side. But that's a distorted view of what's really going on here as well. But in, out of that war in 1868, when they passed the 14th Amendment, the 13th Amendment already, uh, December the 6th of that year, the 13th, 13th Amendment uh, has declared chattel slavery. That means, um, when I say chattel slavery, I'm talking about slavery where people were treated as property and were considered property uh, ownership of, of, of property and human beings. So the word chattel is, is like cattle and human. So CH, cattle, human cattle is what, uh, what, it, what it stands for. So you can say that uh, Everybody in the country today is 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 chattel uh, 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 property because everybody in this country today is uh, is 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 part of the chattel property. I mean, your relationship to the federal government today is that of chattel? Let us say our relationship to, to the federal government is that of a chattel taxpayer. That's our relationship to the federal government. That we are. Uh, taxing cattle. I know that's hard to swallow, but that's what that's what the relationship is. All the other stuff you're talking about, in terms of this country being more free than they are in the way else, you can make that claim, but you cannot make this claim. You go outside the country and see it, as I was for the month of uh, May. When I was out the country of, of May, and I've been a lot of countries where I've been looking at different things that go on in those, those countries as well. Uh, I wrote about it in my post today on Facebook. And I was writing about how it plays out, for example, where it was in 2009 in South Africa. And it's the same, it's, it's the same all over the world. There are no free people on the, on the planet. Not here, not in um, the so-called Western um, uh, states, Western countries, not in, certainly not in, in Russia and China, but it's only here in this country that the, even the claim is, is made. You might notice there's no other country even claims that that is a a, a free that is a free country. No other no no other country makes a claim, the silly claim that it is a free country. Free from what? You're not free from taxation. You're not you're not even free under the terms of the uh, Constitution, as you found out on the. Uh, 6th of January of two, 2021, they went to Washington to exercise a First Amendment freedom, the freedom to peacefully assemble. And they made sure that it would not remain peaceful because they could not otherwise uh, justify what would happen if it remains peaceful. Obviously, you cannot do anything against the people there. 
because you have the right to peaceful assemble. So they had to make sure it would not be peaceful. And that's what, why uh, many, many people are coming around now, Carrie Lake being, being one of them, uh, who's running for the Senate in, in Arizona. That'll be interesting if she gets it because there'll be another voice in the uh, Senate of some people that are serious. It'll add to the more the four or five already there that are serious, but most of them that, that are there are not, are not serious. Most of them in there are just mouthing things to get reelected um, to their post. They're not a bit more serious than the man in the moon. But it would add to the four or five that are there, one of whom is Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is serious as cancer uh, there in, in that body, in the House of Representatives. But uh, you have this guy named Burgess Owens who uh, campaigned as if he's going to get in there and do some, some things. Look what he did when he got in there. He got in there and closed his mouth. You'll see him on TV sometime. He's not, uh, Burgess Owens is not serious. And uh, being out of Utah, he's gotten in there and gotten uh, co-opted. You don't see him working with, with uh, Mary uh, Taylor Greene or some of these others, uh, such as uh, Bo, Bo, uh, Boebert from, um, let's see, Boebert is from Colorado, I think it is. And, and there are a few, they're, 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 they're not very many. You could, uh, most of them in there just, um, you know, anything they have, have to say and do to be reelected, that's what they want to do. They're not, they're not there to do the people's uh, business. That's a side point and an unintended consequence. If it, if it benefits anybody other than themselves, then that's unintended. The intention is to, for them to benefit themselves. And we need to understand our relationship to our, our government. Our relationship to our government is that of tax capital. And we are on a plantation and we're grazing on land that we can never own. The land you own right now, you pay, the house you paid off right now, you would never own those houses. And all these persons like Oprah and all those others, they, they are non-owners at a higher level, a higher a material level of non-ownership. That's where they are. I paid my, my mortgage off. I don't own the house where I'm, where, I'm, where I'm living. I'm still renting from those who will, can come and grab that house if I don't pay those who can never pay off for the ownership of that house. If you think you can pay for the ownership of the house, stop paying your taxes on it and see what happens. There's no ownership of, of, there's no ownership of property in this country by any, by any landowner. All the landowners are grazing on the, on the property. That's how the tax base is operating in this country. And you can never pay it off, and you can never pass it down where it's paid off. They'll pay, when you pass it down, they'll pay up on it as well the rest of their lives. And then when they pass it down to another generation, the same thing will go on over and over again. There'll be, there's no ownership of land in this country except by those who own the country. And that's a group you never see, but they're there. And you feel them in terms of, um, of, of, uh, of, of, of Donald Trump having claimed, I'm going to see what he does. It, it, uh, I think we are going to elect Donald Trump if, if something doesn't happen to him or if they do not do what they did in 2020, which is still the election because the election in 2020 was stolen. Have you heard, by the way, I've heard that a chance to reclaim, I mean, it seems like the uh, government has always had control of uh, the property tax. I mean, I, I don't know much about that. I know the income tax was implemented in 1913. Yeah. But um, what I have to say is, like, I never... It's okay. I heard people, certain people, one time, the only tax they wanted to put on there is a single tax on land. I think George Lloyd or something that he was named for that um, that I'm thinking of. But um, I think he was actually English. But um, I don't, what do you think, though? How long ago do you think we actually did have you know, any semblance of uh, freedom as far as property rights? I mean, how far back do you think we never had it or what? Um, we, anytime they have, you see, we have a, a, a problem with uh, taxation because taxation is enslavement. Taxation is not just uh, theft, it's extortion. And they want to claim that the war in 1776 was over taxation without representation, as if it's better if you are being taxed with representation. Taxation itself is bad. And it should only go on to the extent that there needs to be some way of paying for uh, government services, but government services are not, do not, are not prohibited. We're not paying taxes. Uh, to uh, uh, for, for government services, um, uh, you're paying uh, taxation um, because 
that is the way that they are, that the government is servicing uh, itself by being involved in all these intrusive things they're involved in and giving out all this foreign aid and all this money they're giving out around the world to be the big shots and the, and the, and the king of the block and just taxing people uh, to the point where you you never they never stop uh, taxing. They didn't have an income tax in this country. In fact, the income tax is unconstitutional, although it's been added to the document. The thir the thirteenth amendment, the 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 uh, the sixteenth amendment was passed in nineteen thirteen. Even though it was added to the constitution, that's an unconstitutional act because the original document in Article One, Section Two, Clause uh, Three prohibits direct taxation by the federal government. It's prohibited. That's a term that they've had to come together as a, 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 a single polity. The 13 states come together as a single polity as the United States. That's the United States, but each state being separate with its own sovereignty. They, what made them come together was the terms that they came together on the, in 1787 and ratified in 1788. You cannot change those terms. You see, you cannot amend the, you cannot, uh, listen carefully, you cannot amend the original intent of the document. I'm saying that, and no scholar is going to say that, but they won't say it publicly. They won't say it to me because they're not, they know that they, they cannot get in this, in this space. You cannot, they, there are some things in the Constitution that are unconstitutional. Article, um, the Amendment 14, Section 3 is unconstitutional. You cannot say to the South, in 1868 that they cannot elect their former confederate officers and place them in the Congress of the United States. Why, why is that? Because they have the right under the Article 1, Section uh, 4, Clause 4 of the Constitution to, they have the, the right, they have the guarantee of a Republican form of government. What is a Republican form of government? Republican form of government is that the state, each state has a right to choose its own representative. You can have it imposed upon the states by another state. What state can do that? What federal government can do that? When, this, when, the, when the federal government is a creation of the, of the states. That's what I'm trying to say when, when people say uh, Schumer should be impeached. You can't impeach Schumer. Schumer is a, how, you, how do you turn around as a state create the federal government? And you have the federal government coming in to assume control over state representatives. You can't um, uh, 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 impeach uh, Schumer. Schumer is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a representative of the state of New York. I mean, they need to get, get him out of there, but you can't do it through the impeachment process. You can only do it through uh, invoking, um, you can't do it by invoking Article 1, Section 2, uh, Clause uh, 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 5. You have to do it through the invoking of Article One, Section Five, Clause Two, where the, the each part of the uh, Congress has a right to discipline its own members, but not through the impeachment process. The House can discipline its own members up to including uh, expulsion, and the Senate can do the same thing in uh, Article One, Section uh, Three, uh, uh, Clause Six. But you cannot do it under the impeachment uh, uh, clause which is an Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5 provision, and then Article uh, 1, Section 3, uh, Clause, clause um, uh, Article 1, Section uh, 3, uh, Clause 6 provision, where you, you can, you can uh, use it to, um, uh, let, me, let me go, I should say, Article 2, Section 4 provision, where it says, the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office upon impeachment for conviction of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. So you can impeach the president because his name specifically in that language, you can impeach the vice president, but then it says, and all civil officers of the United States can be impeached, but the senators and the members of the house are not civil officers of the United States. They are elected officers of the state that sent them to the Congress. And they were sent there by watchdog, to be watchdogs, on the part of the people in the House and on the part of the states in the Senate. And therefore, I make this claim as well. And that is the, the, the 17th Amendment is also unconstitutional. Although it's added to the Constitution, it is unconstitutional. 
because the, the senators were, 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 were designed to be the representatives of the states. Now, John has raised a, a very interesting uh, question here, and that is, at what point uh, were, uh, was there um, a semblance of, of, of uh, freedom from a semblance of freedom from taxation? Well, when taxation was in fact close to the people, that's why the taxing agent, it cannot be Biden. Biden does not have the authority to forgive uh, loans of students because that is an that is a and the, the 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 taxing agency must start in the House of Representatives. Now, why is that? It's because the House of Representatives is a people's body, and it goes back to for accountability every two years, so that if it does something done to to the voters, they can then turn them out immediately and 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 take retribution against them. So therefore, the taxing agent must begin in, in, in the House of Representatives. Now, there is no ability for any tax to be imposed on the federal level by the federal government. The federal government is getting its income by the tariff. That's why the, 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 the so-called civil war, it's not a civil war, it's a, it's a, it's a tax war, it's a war of sudden secession, it's a war of... Um, of, 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 of the, the, South, the South succeeding, it is not a, a, a civil war. It's a war uh, that the South has declared to reclaim their right to be independent, as it were, in coming together in 1783 and signing the Emancipation, in signing the, the Treaty of Paris of 1783, they come back to claim their, their right to their own sovereignty and Lincoln has said no to it. And that's why they're fighting. They're fighting this war because of, because of that. Now, when, when it says here, during uh, uh, the proclamation had the effect of changing the legal status of more than 3.5 million enslaved African-Americans, they don't say here, it does not touch the other slaves that, uh, that were in those uh, union states because it did, did not, it did nothing there. The 800,000 slaves in Maryland, in Delaware, in Kentucky, and Missouri, it did nothing at all in those four Union states that had slaves. That's why the 13th Amendment is necessary to be passed. And that would be the 800,000 slaves in those Union states, child slaves. It would, in fact, free those 800,000 slaves. But what about the question of the, the taxation? Well, the taxation was never comprehensive to a tax that was all over the states. Each state did it based upon its, its um, local uh, representation. The people uh, ha having uh, the, the power to do that within their own states. The federal government cannot do it. That term was changed by the 16th Amendment. And I'm saying here to these scholars that that part of the document changes the terms in which the, the confederation of states, the 13 states came together to form the United States. They changed the terms in which they agreed to come together in the United States in 1787. And therefore that is unconstitutional because you cannot change the terms of the agreement at the outset of the country. You cannot do that. And they've done it because they got renegades running this, running, this, running this government. You know, this is such a complex topic. I can't finish it in all the different angles in just a single um, uh, 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 discussion. It's going to take at least another um, uh, uh, time to do it, an another uh, coming at it uh, next week. And I'm going to hopefully finish it up next week because I can see right now that I'm not having enough time to do it given how much time we have now. We're running out of time. But I want to, want to say here that we need to understand that the country had a, a real chance to do something great here that had never been done before, but it dropped the ball on, on, on the way. It had unanimity under the great George Washington and began to slide from away from that unanimity in the aftermath of George Washington's um, presidency in 1797 when George Washington stepped down from power. It hasn't regained that and we have never gotten back to what the founders had intended to do. 
but they had some great things in mind. But we got an off the uh, mark by some things we're doing now that ne was never intended. And we'll pick that up next week at the uh, time of our uh, picking this discussion up on the other side of where we are at this point. Okay, until next week, I want you to follow your dream. If you don't follow your dream, you'll never know what's on the other side of the rainbow.